Uh, good morning, folks. Uh, thanks for joining. Part of what I wanted to do is just to run over the criteria, H16 criteria, as a very quick overview about the types of things to consider and, you know, what companies who I've seen done well in my 13 or so years as an FSO, the sort of things that I've seen companies who, who are successful in, in getting through these criteria. Richie was good enough to go through the statistics on the cars. Certainly that data is quite telling around not only the, the challenges of mobile plants and the principal contractor contractor relationship, but certainly the number of criteria that we've got with mobile plants, because not every car is a hazard. Obviously, sometimes the car is related to the documented process or execution of that process under the OFSC criteria. And just a reminder that all the criteria start with the words, there's a documented process for all the system ensures. So we'll start with that process that's relative to the criteria. Look at how you implement those criteria and make those words come to life. And then look at a verification of the records that you did what you said you would do. And that accountability that FSC has for accredited companies around the criteria is the primary part of your, that's what your accreditation is attached to. Then the uh, local regulatory or jurisdictional requirements. And then also a lot of those cars, uh, in my experience, are for companies not following their own system. So part of your review against the criteria and regulatory requirements, always consider what your system actually says and whether that's executable within your system and reproducible across all your projects. Just a reminder for those of you who aren't aware, the FSC audit criteria guidelines, they set the expectations for the criteria. They're set out as the criteria, the scope in real word terms, and then the possible evidence listed against each criteria. The, the possible evidence isn't a list of like a punch list of things to do to meet the criteria, it's just some suggested things that you may be able to produce that audit to demonstrate compliance. And understanding the criteria is really important to compliance with the scheme. So hopefully I can make that a little bit clearer for, for anyone today. Mobile plant's quite high, comparably to falls from height and traffic. We do do a lot of uh, audits on mobile plan because it's one of the most common hazards across all projects, remembering that the scheme covers a large extent with over 600 companies accredited in the scheme now and with people doing all different types of construction work. Just a quick basic principles on mobile plant. The criteria excludes fixed plants. So we're looking about mobile plant where plant is propelled under its own propulsion, not, not by other things. So it excludes sort of fixed plant. Original equipment manufacturer specifications are really critical. There's a number of criteria that point to that, but obviously, as we all know, as the, the manufacturer specifications are important to making sure that we operate the plant in accordance with those. It's not mandatory, but certainly a plant induction process or a plant onboarding process to assess the plant prior to use on site is advantageous from a systemic point of view. And understanding the minimum regulatory requirements in your jurisdiction is also important because that's obviously a, a primary cause of, uh, of compliance. Just running through the criteria one by one, as I mentioned, we'll just go through the things to consider. Companies who do this criteria well, the risk approach associated with mobile plants, all the all the H criteria, as everyone knows, start with a risk associated with criteria and end with an emergency procedure criteria, and then everything in between. So uh, H16 is no different with that respect. So the things to consider with um, the, the H16-1 criteria is, you know, the company risk management procedural requirements. So what does your system say about how we understand risks at a, at a project level? We also, all the criteria in the 16-1 or the, or the point one start with the application of the hierarchy control and, and how you apply that. Obviously, some of the innovative ideas that Richie's come up with help with some higher order controls rather than administrative and PPE controls from that respect. Project-specific mobile plants likely considering what, what plant will likely have on the project. And that balance between those of you who have your own plant and the contractor plant and hired and non-hired and who, who procured the plant, thinking about how do we apply a consistent set system across those things. The companies who do this well have a risk, risk assessment consistent with their risk procedure with respect to their application of their risk matrix if they're using one. Their, their risk tolerance levels are met. They apply the hierarchy of control and they ensure that project specific assets are considered and assessed in the project risk assessment. So often as an FSO, we'll get to site and we'll have a generic project risk assessment that doesn't take into account some unique things that we've, we find on site, whether it's a unique type of plant, some overhead services, some challenges with adjoining structures or those things, or some unknown underground services that are either inherent to the site or um, have been installed prior to the work ex being executed and us turning up. So we need to take all those things into account. Our plant risk assessment is one of the most um, misunderstood parts of the criteria at times and in our industry. It's a challenging thing, purely the volume of things that we have to do and look at. From our perspective as an FSO, we're looking for the plant risk assessment as a, as a fundamental principle, that it's an assessment of the inherent risks of the plant. That is, what, what risk do the plant itself present? It's not, uh, the plant risk assessment isn't a operational, when we're operating the plant, what are the hazards? That's the safe system of work. So what we're looking at for the from the plant risk assessment perspective 
is how do we make sure or what are the things that are in place to ensure that the plant is inherently safe for use, such as guarding, rollover protection systems, access stairs for, to, to prevent falls, burst protection on hydraulics and other aspects of the machine. So we're looking at the plant when it's not actually operating, what are the inherent risks of, of that particular piece of plant. Um, the companies who do this well have a process to receive the plant risk assessment before the plant arrives on site. Um, those of you who are in site-based roles when plant arrives and you get all the paperwork as it's pulled up to the gate that needs to be used in the next 30 seconds, that's a challenge. The companies who do it well have that pre-arrival to site and plant risk assessments that are specific to the plant on that site that address the inherent risks, as we said. A nice guide, I know it doesn't apply to all states and jurisdiction, and it is guidance, but Appendix C of the Model Cut uh, Plant Code of Practice certainly provide some hazard checklist prompts around the inherent risks associated with plan around such things such as entanglement, crushing, uh, heated elements, etc. Also, the, the companies that do plant resistance well, we have controls that reduce inherent risks and also have a clear way to track any, any controls through the plant risk assessment process that would need to be implemented at an operational level into the safe system of work. So what controls, in addition to the inherent controls, do we need to take, take and transfer to the safe system of work? which is the next criteria. Um, Richie mentioned this one, 16.3, being a, a challenging criteria, and a lot of the things that he spoke about were in, in response to the safe systems of work requirement in criteria H16.3. A lot of companies in the scheme treat this like it's just like a data collection exercise where we, as long as we collect the manual, we've got a plant risk assessment, we, we so, sort of generally say some site-specific things like flashing lights, and that we, um, if it's earth-moving plant or we're doing some demolition work, work that we've got ROPs and FOPs in place. The criteria is to be super clear, it's about the safe systems work established that take those things into account. Now, obviously, it's a chicken and egg thing. You can't take them into account if you don't have them. So the receipt of that information is really important. How do we make sure that that information goes into the safe systems of work? So we'd be looking at the companies who do this well, have a process to receive that information. Obviously, as I was discussed, that's just a plan induction or similar. And then we have a process to review the safe system work inclusive of any identified plant aspects. So safe system work whether it's a JHA, a SWIMS, a SOP or otherwise, that they incorporate for the move, for the use of mobile plan on that particular site. They take into account any operator or OEM specific things such as service or inspection requirements. They take into account findings of the plant risk assessment. So there might be things like the way that the plant needs to operate either through a competency requirement or a safe working slope or gradient that a particular plant that, that needs to be incorporated into a site specific safe system. And then obviously for plant where it's a ROPS for earth moving plant or a FOPS if we're, we require falling object protection in that particular safe system of work. I'm sure we'll have some questions about that, which I'll be happy to answer at the end. 16.4 has a little deviation and we move over to inclusive and, and you'll notice that this is the same as H7.3 in the excavation criteria. So it's the same criteria. It's one of the few that are transposed between two different hazard criteria. This one's looking at the safe systems of work around uh, above ground and underground services that we're taking into account the identification and location of services. So we're understanding where the services are and their location, both overhead and underground, and the reliability of underground services we can talk about, I'm sure. The management of any works adjacent to that service. So whether we're using a pothole or, or a different bucket attachment for excavation work or hand digging, and then overhead services, we're talking about safe working distances relative to the voltage and, and, and advice from the asset earner which is an important part of the criteria that's often missed. So it's not mandatory liaison with the asset owner. It's where what are the triggers within our system that define that we need to talk to the asset owner to understand how close we can be working to that particular asset. The companies who do this criteria well obviously have system prompts for the assessment of underground overhead services. The ones who do it really well do it as a part of early work site establishment that they're understood very early in the process. They have services controls both overhead and underground in, in their safe system of work or similar. And they have site-based controls for positive identification of both above ground and underground services, uh, isolation controls, visible markers, those sorts of things that are very clear about the location and safe working distances for the overhead and underground services they've identified on their project. And just little things you guys would already know around before you dig, asset owners and then any client specific information where you might be on a controlled site such as a defence site where you'll just go and talk to defence estates or something like that and do your best to get the services that, that have been there, conscious that some of them have been there for 100 years. Obviously we need to have other controls in place whereby the service information we receive may be unreliable. 16.5 is mobile cranes. So obviously we don't have criteria for tower cranes as that they're, they're not mobile plant, but tower cranes may be tackled or will be tackled if you get uh, temporary structures 
criteria around the grillage and other 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 fixings for tower cranes. But certainly mobile cranes has its own criteria related to, again, a safe system of work developed for mobile cranes, taking into account ground conditions, whereby we may um, we, we need to get information around compaction test results or things like that relative to a lift. And we understand where, where the location and depth of our underground services and structures, whereby we uh, understand what the ground conditions required and what other controls will need to be put in place by the uh, crane contractor to ensure that that ground is suitable for the forces and the lift that's going to be conducted. The development of lift plans in accordance with relevant legislation, codes of practice and Australian standards is always a curly one, whereby there are mixed jurisdictional code of practice prompts and requirements around things. Certainly in Queensland, there are some more specific things around lift studies and lift plans about when a, a lift plan is required and the difference between a lift plan and a radius drawing when we're, when we're just doing a, what, what sort of lift we are. Certainly, Richie talked about the, the elimination of dual crane lifts earlier. A dual crane lift is, is, is a sensible trigger for a lift plan, obviously, um, when we're removing that. Although when we're moving precast elements, that, that is a, uh, often a trigger for a lift plan as well, when a lift plan would be required. But the company would need to be really clear in their system about what triggers require a specific lift plan within their system. Also taking into account lifting of materials and workers, so obviously uh, lifting rules around the lifting of materials, exclusion zones, rules between soft slings and chains and et cetera, and all our lift, lifting and rigging componentry, which is the next criteria. So how we do that. And obviously our work box use, whether it's a first aid box or a work box and any alternative controls, obviously understanding that a work box is a uh, for, for a lot of companies and for good reason that it's not a preferred control if we can avoid it. Companies to do this criteria well, again, have processes for the receipt of ground condition information as a part of their site establishment early works, as a part of the ground condition assessment. They have specific plant induction requirements for mobile cranes, being specific differences, including some things we'll talk about in criteria H169 around, um, around registration and inspection requirements for cranes, site rules and associated processes for lifting materials and workers, and then procedures and checks prior to the use of a work box. So not just limited to the, uh, the integrity and the safety of the box, but obviously any work at heights controls and other rescue requirements for um, when we decide to use a work box for the work that we're going to undertake. Um, rigging lifting equipment, obviously a follow on to the previous criteria, but also where we're using rigging lift equipment for other activities such as excavators in crane mode and other you know, crawler cranes, etc. This criteria just looks for a system ensuring that there's an inspection and maintenance program for rigging and lifting equipment. So considering things like company and contractor processes for managing rigging and lifting equipment, challenges around um, multiple registers where we've got different PCBUs on our site where a, a crane contractor or other con lifting contractor a rigging, a rigging company who might be doing a structural steel installation or something like that, or a uh, precast job where there's multiple registers from different PCBUs, and we have to understand how we, as as an accredited company, how we manage that and coordinate that on our sites. We need to give some thought to that, but also our site-based inspection and review of rigging and lifting equipment as a part of our normal assurance and governance processes that we've got in place for audit and inspection. And also the varying tagging systems that are in place that we see as FSOs, and, and, and I'm sure all of you have seen, including but not limited to the um, RGBY and other systems that are run on particular sites, about some consistency around those. So the companies who do this well have the prompts linked to other processes for inspection, review of rigging and lifting equipment it's brought to site, and then processes to managing registers, site-specific criteria, and a clear understanding of inspection frequency and tagging regimes, particularly where they're prompted by Australian standards and other manufacturers' requirements about their inspection and testing regimes. Plant movement controls. So Richie spoke earlier about the data associated with people being struck by plant and plant striking other plant being a significant risk in our industry. And the number of incidents that have occurred, um, including while FSOs have been at audit, is always a, a fun thing to deal with while we're uh, in the middle of, a, of, a, of an audit. But certainly plant movement controls, the criteria is quite broad about the system ensures that the movement of plant vehicles on site is controlled. So things to consider here is the difference between a regulated traffic management where we're working on a designated road or, a, or an entry to a road. And also where we've got a, you know, the variations between a very small site where we might have uh, zero frontage and, and no, it is no storage requirements through to a, a large civil project where there is extensive movement of plant at a site level. So just those variations between those things. Um, understanding of site-specific hazards um, on our projects, the way we design our site, 
and certainly, you know, any site rules that that are required for the site around warning devices, spotters, high visibility, and etc. Administrative isolation, engineering, and other controls that we have on the project. The companies do these ones well, have documented traffic movement plans and drawings, and often they're they're, they're defined and controlled exclusion zones around the project, and they have physical controls in place, particularly where we're trying to separate pedestrians and plant, including light plant. And then also that's clear communication of traffic movement controls in an ever moving site, particularly not only at site induction, but also the regular pre starts and other changes at site where we actually need to communicate plant movement controls to workers and others. Our plan operation, verification of competency and, and, and things related to high risk work licenses is one of the most difficult parts for, for our, our industry to manage and navigate. The FSC notif- noticed this uh, many years ago and we came out as a as, as, uh, collective a fact sheet on verif- verification of competency for mobile plant and I strongly encourage you to go to the OFSC website if you haven't already and consider the, uh, the fact sheet requirements and what the minimum expectations of OFSC are. They reflect a large proportion of jurisdictional regulators that their requirements around mobile plant, and and that was deliberately done for a lot of reasons, but also it provides a lot of clarity around what the OFSC would expect on here. Obviously, mobile plant that does not have a specific license requirement, for example, a road profile trimmer or a paving machine in the in the civil industry or the roadworks, and other mobile plant that we encounter on site that doesn't have licensing but also just one of the most common things we hear in fsc is fsc requires and they'll you know insert requirement here that isn't an fsc requirement so the fact sheet's your single source of truth on that matter and i encourage you to look at that and i'm sure we'll get some questions on that the companies that do plan operation and uh licensing and training and competency well have processes that reflect the minimum requirements of fsc that it's very clean Processes that require uh, train.gov RII courses. So you'll be surprised how many are on there for plant that doesn't traditionally require a Horace work license. And they have clear and consistent requirements for contractors. So that's really clear prior to a contractor arriving on site. So it's really difficult when um, we arrive at site as an FSO and, and, and contractors are sort of busily trying to do VOC activities because they weren't aware prior to arriving on site. So it's okay for companies to go add additional things further than what the FSC fact sheet requires, that's fine. That's totally at the discretion of the accredited company, but the FSO will hold you accountable for your system, as I've mentioned earlier. So we'll just follow the bouncing ball on that perspective. And if you get a car on that, that's above and beyond the verification or the the FSC fact sheet. 99.9% 99.9% of the time, it will be because the, the, the company's system required further things that weren't met on the project. 16.9, we're nearly there, folks. Plant inspection and registration. So this is closely aligned to 16.3, as Richie mentioned earlier. The things to consider here is around the regulatory requirements for registration and ongoing inspections, such as cranes, concrete pumps, and other plant. OEM specific inspection requirements that are indigenous to uh, traditional maintenance requirements that are required by the manufacturer on a particular type of plant. Pre-starts being specific to the plant, so we don't have generic pre-starts, that the pre-start requirements for each machine reflect what the OEM manual requires, and any mobile plant that requires commissioning. Now, this is a rarity. It's in the criteria for a reason, because there are there is mobile plant from time to time that's required to be commissioned or, or constructed prior to use on site. So your system needs to take into that, that into account, even if that's not something that's a traditional part of your, your business or undertaking. So the companies that do this criteria well have processes again for the induction of mobile plant or the receipt of plant on site with specific prompts for regulator registration, design registration, and any ongoing inspection requirements. For example, mobile cranes with annual and 10 year or a concrete pump with an annual or six year inspection requirement, and then prompts to ensure that pre-starts are specific to the plant, as I mentioned earlier, prior to being used on site. So how do we communicate that to contractors to make sure that that (laughs) is in place prior to use? Plant maintenance. So this is just this is to ensure that there's a process in place for the ongoing maintenance of mobile plant. Again, it covers your own plant plus contracted plant. Things to consider around that are plant specific requirements, OEM manual specifications, et cetera, that are of the schedule for maintenance. It's never surprising plant that the OEM manual specifies a 250 hour service and we're getting plant that's a thousand or 1500 because that's what the company decided they should do with outside those OEM specifications and no rhyme or reason around that. Processes to manage plant on site for long-term projects where once the, when the plant's inducted or, or received on site that's within service period but what does the accredited company do to make sure where the plant's been on site and that 
currency expires and it requires servicing, how do we keep track of that prior to um, it exceeding the service designated service period? And then obviously company owned plant versus contracted plant. The companies who do this stuff well um, have a plant induction again that check the currency of months before use on site, processes to manage checks of OEM specifications and map those to the plant records. And then obviously plant uh, processes to manage ongoing maintenance checks. So your site inspections, plant registers, et cetera, whereby we can keep track of plant that's on site and making sure it's maintained within the service period designated by the uh, OEM. A plant related emergency. So like I said, the, the uh, all the high hazard criteria bookended by our risk criteria and emergency criteria. So plant related emergencies that assure the system ensures that those they're established specific to the scope of works. The things to consider around site specific potential emergency scenarios related to mobile plant use on site, site conditions that may introduce new potential emergency situations, such as large excavations or other changes to the site, whereby a new emergency may uh, reveal itself and other criteria will cover the review, not just drills of emergency situations, but when we when there are prompts within our system to address or review our emergency response plan or equivalent for our project, making sure that's taken into account. And the companies who do this criteria well have general every project emergency potential scenarios and procedures and site specific ones that are triggered through our uh, project risk assessment process, our emergency risk assessment process or our project review process that we have in place to make sure that we maintain those potential emergency scenarios that they're understood and known. Companies also who do this well have thorough communication of emergency response processes to workers and others on site, and they integrate their emergency procedures into their safe systems of work, particularly around things that I mentioned earlier, whereby we're introducing a work box or we have specific plant working away from the main hub of the project or other things whereby the site specific things that need to be integrated the safe system work and we can't rely on our core emergency plan to cover those things. Uh, other sources of information, as I said earlier, I really and strongly encourage you to go and look at the uh, the OFSC, have some really useful documents. There is an entire fact sheet on mobile plan. I think it's about uh, 17 or 18 pages that'll go through a lot of the things I've spoken about today that go through each criteria in some detail about the sorts of things that companies can do. Certainly when you're preparing for an audit or responding to a corrective action that you may have received or just reviewing your system in any way, shape or form, that fact sheet's really helpful to make sure that you can uh, read and interpret the criteria consistently with the FSO. Just be conscious that there's a column in there that, that talks about the types of things that you could do. They're not mandated things. It just gives you some support and guidance about these are the sorts of things that you could do to comply with this criteria. And obviously with an ultimate aim of improving the safety of mobile plan on your projects. And as always, the FSC audit guideline, which I've gone through as a part of my presentation today. Thanks everyone.